On this edition of Native Report, we meet artist Karen Savage Blue and view selected paintings from Spirit, a mid-career retrospective. We visit the National Eagle Center, an environmental learning center on the Mississippi River. And we observe a multi-agency prescribed burn designed to rejuvenate and enhance prairie grassland. Okay. I want them to get out and then you can go. And we also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Artist Karen Savage Blue challenged herself to paint one painting each day for 365 days. This ambitious project showcases the extraordinary beauty of everyday scenes. The four season landscape of northern Minnesota is the subject of artist Karen Savage Blue who painted one oil painting per day for one year. The results hang in the George Morrison Gallery of the Duluth Art Institute. I live in a very beautiful place, and I'm not sure if I could have got the same imagery if, if I lived in a, uh, in a larger city or, well, in, in the, the southwestern part of the country, we, we won't see these things. And I wanted to paint uh, our wonderful northern Minnesota landscape because it's so diverse, so rich, so lush. We have so much here. As a landscape artist, it's, you're, you're working with a, a subject matter that, that is so profound, so majestic. Sometimes it's hard to do that justice or to even get close in, to uh, reflecting just how beautiful it really is. And that's something I strive to do in my work, is to, to show that, that magic that we have in our world. I think that because I look at the earth as being a female and painting the earth, I have that connection there. And, um, it is always my goal, I'll, I always strive to have people understand our natural world, to have an appreciation for that, to, to value it, and uh, to protect it. Karen combined the media of photography with painting to produce her deeply personal art. This pushed her boundaries as an artist. It was quite an endeavor, that, that's for sure. Um, my reasons for starting that series was uh, I needed a challenge. Um, also, I like to paint, and I was going to try, come back to using oil paints again. And um, I thought this would be a really good way to get back in touch with the medium and uh, really get to know it and eventually try to master that medium. Also, I was um, messing around a little bit with some digital photography, and I wanted to connect those two, painting and photography. So I came up with the scheme of uh, every single day, I would take a series of photographs from places that I was visiting. and. Then when it was time to paint, I'd take a look at those photographs and uh, pick one out that I would use as a reference for my painting. Sometimes I was in southern Minnesota. A few times I was up near Leech Lake. 
down towards the Mille Lacs area. But the majority of the time I was on the Fond du Lac Reservation and in Duluth. I've used a paintbrush um, quite a bit. And uh, the palette knife is, a, is an awesome tool for, uh, for oil paint when you, when you want to create it and apply it a lot thicker. You know, if you're going to be applying paint with a really small instrument that doesn't move, you don't have a lot of flexibility with that. It, it creates a, its own challenge, but I think the, the results, because I had to go a different route to get what I wanted, I think the results are, are interesting. Oil paint is Karen's favorite medium to work with. After she completed her 365 series, and after a short break, she took up another project that combines the landscape with human elements and figures within the painting. I transitioned into uh, another way of painting. I wanted to get away from the camera. I wanted to get away from having something in front of me as a reference. And I totally went a completely different direction where the application, initial application of the paint was much more spontaneous and much more random. And then whatever was there with that initial application, it became the basis for what was to evolve. We as humans, you know, I feel we have a really very close connection to the earth and our environment. And uh, it's very important for us to maintain that healthy relationship. How can we, we love our earth as much as we love ourselves? So I was thinking, well, if I could put this human form or aspects of the human form actually into aspects of the landscape, maybe that can help create a, a bridge between that thinking. It might not make a lot of logical sense on one hand, but, but on the other hand, it, to me, it makes perfect sense for when, uh, when we need a vessel for connecting ourselves to our larger earth. I want to be the one that inspires others that has developed technique that, you know, would be looked on as something someone else would like to try. And I don't want to get too hung up on what others have done. I want to create my own thing. Alcohol, drugs, nicotine, gambling, shopping, sex. Addiction persists in our communities despite its negative effects on social and personal life. An addicted person may not even be aware of their lack of control or of the problems caused by the addiction. People who have problems with addiction generally have a lot of stress that can trigger them to abuse whatever they are addicted to. What's not clear is if addiction is a true medical illness or a mental condition and whether addiction and dependence on a drug or alcohol are the same thing. Addictions are often seen as a weakness or a character flaw, and this is simply not true. Addictions can happen to anyone. Sometimes people start out with prescription pain medicines or anxiety medicines and can quickly become addicted to them. Drugs like heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine can cause addiction with a single use. Cigarettes and alcohol can cause addiction with just a few uses in some people. Addiction stimulates cells in the brain's reward center and with repeated use can actually change the structure of the brain. Often there are other illnesses that go hand in hand with addiction and can increase the chances of becoming addicted or dependent. Depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, PTSD, schizophrenia, and other mental health conditions often coexist with addiction. Sometimes the mental health condition is a result of the addiction, and sometimes the addiction is a result of self-medicating the condition. There are other consequences in addition to just the cost of using. Job losses or demotions, breakup of families, loss of credit, homelessness, 
and the risk of illnesses such as HIV or hepatitis C are very real risks associated with addiction. There is a crisis in our entire country with opiate use currently, and overdose deaths are common in all of our communities. Babies are more and more frequently being born addicted to opiates and methamphetamine, and this makes it much more difficult for those babies to thrive and catch up with babies who are not born addicted. Relapse can happen to people who are trying to beat addictions, and this doesn't necessarily mean failure. It just means the treatment needs to be individualized and adjusted. Recovery from addiction is a lifelong process, and relapses shouldn't make anyone give up. Regardless of how bleak this all sounds, there are treatments available for addictions. Inpatient treatment, 12-step programs, meetings and sponsors have been proven to work. It's easy to think this is a hopeless situation, but addictions are treatable and there are many extremely good people in our communities who have had problems with addiction in the past. Addictions are treatable and help is available. You don't have to hit rock bottom to ask for help. My email address is at the bottom of the screen with any questions or any topics you would like addressed. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio, and this is Health Matters. After Alaska, Minnesota competes with Florida for having the highest population of eagles. The National Eagle Center in downtown Wabasha, Minnesota is home to six rescued eagles. Join us now as we learn more about the center. On this overcast spring day, captive eagles at the National Eagle Center call to one of their own as it soars freely over the Mississippi River. These eagles are rescues, and the center is their permanent home. One of the great things about the National Eagle Center is you get to come up close and personal and see the eagles that we're caring for, but right outside here is their natural habitat, the refuge, and we're seeing live eagles out there in the wild and the eagles here are responding to that. And so they see these other eagles and this eagle activity and they're kind of scolding them. They're looking, look, you're getting too close to my territory. And we're, we were hearing that call, that warning call to those eagles out there on the refuge. The NEC can place its beginnings back to an earlier time when people would flock to the banks of the Mississippi during the winter months to watch these magnificent birds. During the, the 60s, 70s, and early 80s when the bald eagle was rare and endangered in the lower 48 states because of the, the devastating impact of DDT, this was still one place that people could come to see uh, concentrations of eagles. We really uh, date our beginnings back to 1989 when uh, the Wabasha Chamber of Commerce recognized this, this was occurring. The Wabasha was attracting people uh, in the winter months of all time to see this phenomenon. And uh, so they formed a committee called Eagle Watch. Uh, and eventually um, Eagle Watch, that committee decided, you know, we should incorporate a nonprofit. Uh, so that is still our corporate name today. So this center opened in 2007. On average, the center welcomes over 80,000 visitors each year, and for the last year alone, those visitors came from 115 countries. The thing that, that uh, the National Eagle Center added over the years uh, as an element of the visitor experience that really makes us unique is, is our live Eagle Ambassadors. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so very proud to introduce you to our 16-year-old female bald eagle. This is our lovely angel. We have four on exhibit uh, that, that visitors can meet uh, and can be up close to. So it's such a unique experience in terms of inspiration and education to be literally this close to a live eagle and then look out the windows and see them uh, thriving in the wild. They each have their own story. Washaka is uh, our male bald eagle uh, who um, was found in Florida as a uh, first year uh, bird because he uh, uh, had a tumor on his left eye 
was not able to hunt and uh, fend for himself. They were able to remove the tumor, but he uh, was blind in his left eye. In addition to the up-close encounters visitors can experience, the center has a variety of educational displays. The center also does outreach programs, bringing their Eagle ambassadors into the community. We get all kinds of requests and calls and um, you know, typically things like uh, schools and school events, classroom programs or gymnasium style programs where we would come in uh, you know, an hour long type program where we're educating large groups of students. And one of our Eagles, Harriet, is quite famous for her work with veterans, was even featured on the Minnesota Support the Troops license plate for her outreach work with, with veterans. Um, uh, we also do um, American Indian type programming, supporting powwow and seasonal ceremony upon request when, when we have eagles and staff available. And it is at powwows that you will see an abundance of eagle feathers as part of the dancers' regalia. The eagle is also emulated by the men traditional dancers. More outfits have black and white feathers on their side. They have them around here, they have them on the sides, but they also signify a bustle, a black and white bustle. On the back, it's a black and white. There's 34 feathers to that bustle on the back. Sometimes you see 38. You see 34 in the back to begin with because you signify that bird that's out here. You see a bird that, that is down on and, and walking. So uh, as a traditional dancer, you, you monitor and watch him the same way that you would dance. So if he moves his head as so, you do the same. You know? So you're, you're learning from that eagle. He is the most magnificent animal and creature that was put on, on this earth by the Creator. Today's society, we see an eagle go by, we put an offering down, yeah, because it's the spirit of something or someone. You know, it's both honoring and humbling at the same time to have the opportunity to work with, you know, charismatic megafauna like the eagles that represent so much to so many people, whether it's a, you know, a visionary icon or a symbol of the nation or, or a spiritual aspect of the eagle. We have the responsibility of being the stewards and caring for these injured eagles, but also sharing them with the public. This is a Dickinoggin. It's a cradle board of, of the uh, Chippewa Indians that made for, the, for their little children. This was made for me over 85 years ago, and so some of the beads are coming off because all the grandkids wanted to be photographed in it. Uh, so the uh, ladies would line the Dickinoggin with rabbit fur, and so, so the children would stay warm and if the rabbit fur was uh, the in, you know all the fur was toward the child and then they at the uh, they put the moss around the uh, so the baby it using it as a as diapers because they didn't have diapers in those days oftentimes uh, the ladies would put the babies against a tree and then if the wind came along and knocked it over, well, this would save the child. So that's why they have that little outreach there. This is a dream catcher, and it's uh, when the children are sleeping or have a dream, this helps them to understand their dream. Some of the beads are coming off, so haven't repaired it very well, but it uh, still is usable. A prescribed burn is an intentionally lit, controlled fire used by land managers to replicate natural fire events. We followed from start to finish a multi-agency fire crew led by the Shakopee Minnewakanton Land and Natural Resources Department as they conduct a late season burn. So I'm gonna get the burn unit. Beginning in the spring and extending through fall, the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community Department of Land and Natural Resources conducts prescribed burns on and off reservation lands. 
It all begins with the morning briefing. We brief every time before we implement a prescribed burn. We make sure that everybody, every firefighter is aware of what we're doing, uh, the ecological objectives we're trying to meet, and also the safety considerations. We really have to be cognizant of firefighter safety. It's critical. What's going on here today is we're uh, administering a prescribed burn for Three Rivers Park District in cooperation with the tribal government. Uh, Three Rivers Park District has asked me to administer several of their prescribed burns um, in order to help basically uh, enhance their capacity to manage their prairie restorations. This one is uh, a 55 acre prairie restoration at Doyle Kennefick Regional Park. We have the Bureau of Indian Affairs here from the Great Lakes Agency, the Midwest Regional Office, Three Rivers Park District, and tribal staff. So it's a, it's a cooperative effort. I coordinate the wildland and prescribed burn program for the tribal government. Um, I've been asked to administer this burn. I cannot do this burn by myself without the help of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the cooperation with Three Rivers Park District. After everyone gets to their assigned places, a drip torch is used in several locations to start the fire. The plan is for the flame to meet up in the center of the burn. It's a tall grass prairie restoration and Tall grass prairies evolve with a frequent fire regime. They typically burn historically every one to three years, uh, up, upwards of maybe five years. So what we're really doing here is we're just implementing a natural phenomena that happened uh, before large landscape level conversion. We're just doing it in a, in a more controlled manner and that, that's really what a prescribed burn is. is essentially it's a, it's a controlled wildfire. Uh, the fuel that we're dealing with is, is fuel type 3, which for uh, people that don't understand fuel type 3, it's a, it's a very heavy grass, it's, it's tall grass. Um, the main fuel source that's carrying the fire right now is your warm season grasses, and they can get upwards of 6 to 9 feet tall, so that produces uh, an enormous amount of radiant heat and, and pretty active fire behavior, high flame length. We use uh, an ignition device called a drip torch, and uh, that's a mixture of three or four parts diesel and one part gasoline. So that, that is um, ignited through a wick on the end and it, dro it drips fuel, ignited fuel, on the fuels, so the grasses, and that's how we, control, we uh, ignite the, the prescribed burn in a controlled fashion instead of, say, putting down um, gasoline on the fire, it, it's very dangerous. So what makes today a good day for this bird? Well, generally a bluebird day with, uh, you know, light winds um, and clear skies are, are really good burn days. So high pressure systems kind of uh, sort of calm the winds down and allow us to control the burn in, in a better manner. The fire behavior, uh, topography plays a, a critical role when, when fuels and topography line up fire moves faster upslope than it does downslope. So uh, when we're on the fire line out here, we really have to be cognizant of um, even minor topographic changes because the fire behavior will increase. Um, topography can influence fire behavior because the fuels uh, are pre-treated essentially as it moves upslope and it increases the, the fire behavior. This is one of five scheduled burns today for Sean and his multi-agency crew and this one went according to plans. This is very much the result I was expecting. Um, prairie, tall grass prairie usually burns um, to near completion. It, it's very much a sort of a moonscape afterward, but that ash is critically important for the growth next year. So this prairie, although it looks like it's a scorched landscape, will come back far healthier. The tribal government has a, an active wildland prescribed burn program. Um, and I think there's organizations like Three Rivers Park District, uh, local municipalities that just do not have the capacity to implement uh, prescribed burns like this. So as a good neighbor, um, the tribe is uh, willing to offer their assistance in any capacity that we have to help them out. When I first started this prescribed burn program, it was really difficult to get people to buy into burning prairies or burning any sort of vegetation for that matter, but the culture's changed now. And what, what's really nice is that working for an employer like the SMSC is that fire is embedded in their culture. I mean, I look at them as a, basically the first fire practitioners in the region, and, and I'm just adding to that legacy. That's all I'm really doing.
For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors across Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you again on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Partial funding for this episode of Native Report is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.